In the ninth chapter of Romans, verses 1 through 6, St. Paul talks about the children of the flesh and the children of the promise. Last time we saw in Galatians chapter 3, verses 14 through 18, that there was a covenant of promise made and confirmed in Christ 430 years before the birth of the nation at Sinai and the establishment of the covenant of the law. The language of Galatians 3, 14 through 18 indicates and identifies Genesis 12, 3, and 7. But was Genesis 12, 3, and 7 430 years before Sinai? Wasn't it longer? Was Israel not 400 years in the bondage of Egypt after Joseph's uh, selling into slavery alone? Well, these are two different questions, as we indicated last year. I wish, uh, last time, I wish to deal with them separately. Let's take the first one. Was Genesis 12, 3, and 7 430 years before Sinai? Can we show that to be the case by the scriptures? We said that we could, and now I'm going to tell you how that works out. Genesis 12, 5 tells us that Abram was 75 years old when he left Haran. Genesis 21.5 says that Abram was 100 years old when Isaac was born, which puts us 25 years after Genesis 12.3. Genesis 25.20 says that Isaac was 40 years old when he married Rebekah, so now we're 65 years from Genesis 12.3. In Genesis 25:21, which is the next verse, Rebekah was barren and Isaac entreated the Lord for her, whereupon she soon found herself in the family way. Now the normal sense of the language would tell us that not many years passed from the marriage of Isaac and Rebekah to the birth of Esau and Jacob, though there is nothing in the Bible that I am aware of that gives us an exact uh, time. Let's say for the moment that it was five years, which seems adequate under the circumstances and in light of the narrative. We now are down the line 70 years from Genesis 12.3. Genesis 47.2 tells us that Jacob lived 17 years in Egypt and died at the age of 147. So now we're 217 years after Genesis 12.3. Genesis 50 in verse 22 says that Joseph lived 110 years after the death of Jacob, which takes us to the year 327. 327 years after Genesis 12.3, that is, not the year 327. Acts 7.23 says that Moses was a full 40 years old when he killed the Egyptian and fled Egypt. Acts 7.30 says that it was exactly 30 years after, 40 years after that, exactly 40 years after that, when God appeared to Moses in the burning bush. From that day to Sinai was no more than a year and probably not that long. Exodus 19.1 says it was the third month after leaving Egypt that they camped in the wilderness of Sinai and this was the very 430 years later spoken of in Galatians 3, 17 and 18. We do not know the exact time from the burning bush to the exodus itself but certainly the time was not extensive. So now, adding the 80 years from Moses' birth to Sinai, we have accounted for 407 years, or 408 perhaps, which leaves us 22, 23 years to account for to see if they realistically join these two time segments together into 430 years. How shall we do this? What I'm going to do is give you an approximation but I think that you will see it is fitting. Genesis 46.11 tells us that Gershon, Merari, and Kohath, the grandfather of Moses, were already born when Levi 
came to Egypt with Jacob. Jacob was 130 at the time, and it was 17 years before his death. If Genesis 46.11 tells us, as it probably does, that Kohath was the middle son of Levi, then it is reasonable to assume that he was at least 20 years old, perhaps older, when Jacob died. Joseph's sons were already born when Jacob came to Egypt, and Joseph lived to see Ephraim's children to the third generation. Amram, Moses' father, was Kohath's son, according to Exodus 6.18 and Numbers 3.19. Now, these were immediate children. There are no gaps here in the genealogy, as some would like to see. The text makes it clear that this was father and son. Genesis 41.46 says that Joseph was 30 years old when he was made ruler in Egypt, and this was at the very beginning of the seven years of plenty. Jacob came down into Egypt in the middle of the lean years, around 10 years later. This would have made Joseph about 40 years old when Jacob came into Egypt. Jacob lived 17 years after that, so Joseph was around 57 years old when Levi died. Levi, Jacob's third born, came eight children before Joseph and must have been at least 10 years older. So he was no less than 67 years old when Jacob died. Joseph lived 110 years after the death of his father, which made him about 167 years old. Levi died at the age of 137, some 30 or 40 years earlier, and 70 years after the death of Jacob, or thereabouts, and 87 years after coming into Egypt. Now remember that Kohath, the grandfather of Moses, was alive, and so was his younger brother when Levi came into Egypt. Kohath lived to be 133, which means that he was somewhere around 125 when Joseph died, and that he probably lived another 10 or 15 years. According to Exodus 6, 8, or 6.18, I beg your pardon, Amram was the oldest son of Kohath. Now the practice in this era was for men to marry about 40 years old and to have children at least by age 50. Now this may have been somewhat retarded because of the captivity. Even so, Amram, Moses' father, was certainly alive and at least 50 years old when Joseph died. Now, without doubt, the matter of having children was put in a different context under the new Pharaoh. And then, too, Aaron was born before Moses, and apparently before the rule went into effect about killing the male children, for we read of no such difficulties and tensions surrounding the birth of Aaron. If Moses was born when Amram was 73 years old, which would have been a bit late but not unusual and particularly under the circumstances, this would account for the 430 years from Genesis 12:3 to Sinai. On the other hand, if we made the promise of Galatians 3:16 to refer to Genesis 17, which is certainly enlarging upon the covenant of promise, but we don't think the beginning of it, then we are faced with much more difficulty. We've already stretched this time about as much as is reasonable. To add another 22, 3, 4 years would make Amram about 100 years old when Moses was born and older still at the birth of Miriam. Both the facts as we can discern them and the language of Genesis 12, 3 and 7 compared to the language of, of Galatians 12, or Galatians 3.16, make the covenant of promise spoken of in Galatians 3.16 a reference to Genesis 12.3 and 7. What then shall we say about the 400 years of Genesis 15.13? Well, first let's read that. Let's read Genesis 15.13 to 16. And he said unto Abram, Know of a surety that thy seed shall be a stranger in the land that is not theirs, 
and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them four hundred years. And also that nation whom they shall serve will I judge, and afterwards they shall come out with great substance, and thou shalt go to thy fathers in peace, and thou shalt be buried in a good old age. But in the fourth generation they shall come hither again, for the iniquity of the Amorites is not yet full. We want to take note that the land in which Abraham and his children sojourned almost exclusively from Genesis 15 to the Exodus was the Egyptian empire. Abram came first into the land of Canaan, but he didn't stay long because of the murderous Canaanite tribesmen. Now God, remember, had not yet given them the land. It was still in the possession of the Canaanites. From Gerar south was all part of the Egyptian empire. Well, it wasn't deep Egypt to the land of the pharaohs, but it was the Egyptian empire. Clearly, it is this whole territory that God is talking about as the land where they would sojourn as strangers. They were afflicted by these people. Their herds were in jeopardy. Their wells were stolen or vandalized. Their women were sometimes taken and so on. When Abraham wanted, a, or Abraham wanted a burial place for Sarah, he had to buy it because he didn't own a spot of ground to call his own. In this Genesis 15 passage, God does not say that they will be slaves all of that time, nor that they will suffer constant mistreatment, but that they will be servants and will be afflicted at least some time. That doesn't indicate the entire four years will be will be one of affliction. And, of course, too, depends on what affliction means. For a good part of their time in Egypt, after Joseph, for example, they were not slaves, but they were guests in receipt of the royal treatment because of Joseph. Yet everyone in Egypt was the servant of Pharaoh. And related to this thought, it is clear by any accounting that the children of Israel were not in Egypt after the selling of Joseph for 400 years. We've just gone to some pains to show that from Joseph's selling into slavery until the Exodus could not have been more than 255 years. God told Abraham that they would be brought out in the fourth generation. The matter of generations is a bit thorny in the Bible, but it is certainly not a hundred years in length at this point in biblical history. Joseph saw three generations of Ephraim in a hundred and ten years. One generation, Ephraim himself, had already followed Joseph. It was in the third generation of Ephraim, also the generation of Moses, that Israel left Egypt. When all these things are looked at in context and proper perspective, the 430 year span can only be from Genesis 12, 3, and 7 to Sinai. In that 15th chapter of Genesis, the basis of the national covenant is given. The man under consideration was Abram. Abram means the father of a nation. He was married to a woman named Sarai, or Sarai, depending on how you prefer it. And Sarai means the mother of a nation. Abram was a worshiper of the true God who lived in Ur of the Chaldees. His father was an idol maker. Abram was vexed by what he saw, and the Lord led him out of Ur of the Chaldees and brought him into Canaan, which later became the promised land of the Israelites. When God appeared to Abram in Canaan here in the 15th chapter, he caused a great sleep to fall upon him after telling him to slay some animals and flay them and make sacrifices upon a stone altar. In his deep sleep, his trance, Abram saw fire coming down from God and making the sacrifices effective. There was a great horror of darkness upon Abram. Then God spoke to Abram again. God said, first of all, that he would make a great nation of him, and he was going to give him a land. The boundaries are stated near the end of the 15th chapter. From the river of Egypt to the great river Euphrates, certain tribes inhabited that land at that time, and these tribes are identified by name. 
God's pledge was associated with animal sacrifices which God had instructed Abram to make and which God consecrated with fire. God told Abram that the horror of darkness in his vision was typical of the fact that his natural seed would be servants for 400 years in a strange land. But God added that after that, in the fourth generation, he would bring Abram's descendants out of that land with great substance and would bring them to the very land in which Abram was sitting and in which the sacrifice was being made. God said that he would confirm that promise in a covenant with Abram at a later date. And this was a reference to the giving of the law at Sinai. Now in Joshua 21, and this is very important, I hope you listen to this carefully. In Joshua 21, beginning with verse 43, God indeed gave to the nation of Israel all the land that he promised to Abram in Genesis 15. Now listen, they possessed all of it, and none of the promises of God failed. I'm going to quote that 21st verse of, uh, 43rd verse of Joshua 23. And the Lord gave unto Israel all the land which he sware to give unto their fathers, and they possessed it, and dwelt therein, and the Lord gave them rest round about according to all that he sware unto their fathers. And there stood not a man of all their enemies before them. The Lord delivered all their enemies into their hand. Listen, listen, listen. There failed not any good thing which the Lord had spoken unto the house of Israel. All came to pass. All came to pass, verses 43 through 45. It is not uncommon to hear Christian Zionists whose entire doctrine is tied to the belief that Israel never possessed the inheritance that God promised Abram in Genesis 15 and that part of the fulfillment is in the future in a reestablished old covenant trying desperately to explain away this very adamant and articulate passage. It is unfortunate that they are not as interested in the truth of the Bible as they are in their sectarianism and protecting their traditional views. Israel had been in the Egyptian empire some 400 years from Genesis 15. They were led out through the Red Sea into the wilderness of Sinai, where their identity as a nation was established through the law of God, and they were led into the land of Canaan, although not immediately because of the unbelief of that first generation. In Genesis 16, Abraham began to fret that he had no seed, no son, and he could not see how the promise could be fulfilled without a child to carry out his lineage. Well, Sarah could not have children, and she felt guilty about that. She saw Abram fretting and worrying. It bothered her, so she suggested that Abram take her servant woman, Hagar, and have a child by her. Then he would have a child with which to inherit the promise. Well, this seemed good to Abram, and he did it. It probably would not have seemed good to him if his heart had been in the right place and if he had had more confidence in God than he was demonstrating at that time. Now in the 17th chapter of Genesis, God appeared again to him and he said, Abram, walk before me and be perfect. God was going to make him another covenant and he had first mentioned in the 12th chapter. But first, he would change his name to Abraham. The name Abraham means the father of many nations. It's a greater name than Abram, which means the father of a nation. The second name connotates a greater title and greater privileges, and that's why God changed the name to Abraham, of course. He also changed Sarah's name to Sarah, which means the mother of many nations, or the mother of a multitude. 
God said that Abraham, Abraham would become the father of descendants so numerous that they would cover the whole earth, a family with members more numerous than the sands of the seashore and the stars of the sky. This promise would be realized by a son that Sarah would bear him. Now this is a reaffirmation and an enlargement on Genesis 12, 3 and 7, in particular 7, where he said, Abraham, to you and to your seed. Well, Abraham knew that he was too old to have another son, and he found it amusing that God had said his barren wife would conceive. He reminded God that he already had a son. And he expressed the hope that Ishmael, the son of the Egyptian woman Hagar, would be the recipient of God's promised blessing when he said, Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. But God said that it would not happen that way. Ishmael would not be the seed that would result in the multitude of nations. Later, God instructed Abraham to cast out the bondwoman and her son because, he said, the son of the bondwoman could never be heir with the child of the free woman. This showed clearly that the natural seed, the nation of Israel, had no inheritance in Genesis 12, 3 and 7, by merit of their natural heritage and birth. That this was indeed the prophetic witness is confirmed by St. Paul in the last part of Galatians 4, as we shall see in a moment. As Jesus told the Jews in the 8th chapter of St. John's Gospel, they may be Abraham's children according to the flesh, but spiritually speaking, they were children of their father, the devil, and they had nothing at all in common with Abraham. In Galatians 3.26, the apostle says, For ye are all the children of God by faith in Jesus Christ. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now listen. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither bond nor free. There is neither male nor female. For ye are all one in Jesus Christ. And if ye be Christ's, then are ye Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. Or in other words, the covenant of promise. In the covenant of promise, there was never any distinction between Jew and Gentile. We are all one new man in Christ, making us Abraham's seed, not through natural birth as Israelites, but through spiritual birth into Christ, and heirs according to the covenant of promise that God made with Abraham. This was an entirely different covenant than the national covenant made with Abram for a nation. The apostle has said then that not all of those national Israelites were planned to be a part of the spiritual seed. They are not all Israel which are of Israel. That is, the children of the flesh are not counted for the seed, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Therefore, the unbelief of many of national Israelites was not in contravention to the plan of God because it was never the plan of God that all of national Israel should be a part of that spiritual seed in the covenant of promise. Neither was it the plan of God that all of the spiritual seed should be taken from the nation of Israel. And so the unbelief of the Israelites, as unfortunate as it was, was never out of keeping with these covenants and these promises and these projected plans that God made with Abraham. 